I look forward to share with you um, an interesting topic, making research and extension work for rice farmers in West Africa. And I think it's, that's a big challenge. You know, everybody wants to know how, how, how do we do it. Um, now I want to share with you um, a journey uh, I, I have for the past 12 years uh, on implementing and changing rice production practices in West Africa. They have been successful and they have been, they're in the process of being scaled up. So I want to uh, share with you um, that story. Um, my presentation has uh, three sections. First, I give you a background. Then we go on a big journey together. And then I'll have some reflections at the end about why I think and what do I think um, why this was a success or is a successful um, initiative. So first, we need to start to think about so what, what, who is growing rice in West Africa, and how do those rice systems look like? Rice is actually an indigenous crop to West Africa. It has been domesticated 3,500 years ago uh, in the inner delta of Mali. So there is an African rice. It's a different species of rice than what we eat usually in the super, from the supermarkets, which is the Asian rice. African rice today is mostly um, uh, consumed in the region. It's diminishing in its importance, and you would not find it here in the U.S. Um, so, but having said that, it has been a staple for a very, very long time, and it has been cultivated all throughout West Africa. So if we look today at the rice production basins in West Africa, these are the very large basins. Um, you see, you can find rice production all over the region. The smaller, the smaller rice production areas are not included in this, uh, in, these, um, in this picture, but there is many of them. So looking at the rice production now, and when we look at the, at the climate in, in West Africa, we see that the climate is, uh, is um, arranged basically in bands uh, from arid to semi-arid, subhumid to humid zones. Um, in, in horizontal bands, they go from east to west. And so rice is grown in all of those zones. So rice is grown in all the climates in West Africa. Then on top of that, rice is grown in many different cropping systems in West Africa. So you may be most familiar with the irrigated rice production systems, uh, which is uh, up here on the right, where you have irrigation water um, um, feeding your rice paddies. Um, only 15% of the surface in West Africa is irrigated rice, but it produces about 40% of the production. Now, more than 40% of the area is upland rice. So you grow rice like you would grow beans or corn. Um, and either that's on, the, on, on either in slash and burn environments, or as you can see down here, um, in non slash and burn environments, where farmers just cultivate the crop as they will cultivate corn. And then we have the, uh, on the bottom right, the rain fed lowland rice production which is also a, mostly in depressions. More than 30% of the area, rice area in West Africa, is rain-fed lowland. It's grown in depressions. And in the second half of the rainy season, when there's a lot of water accumulating, it starts to um, flood those rice areas. And the, the height can be very variable. So you see this gentleman, as the water comes to his knees, and is maybe, you know, not yet at the end of the rainy season, so the, the water will still rise. Um, most productive is, of course, irrigated rice. Second productive is the rain-fed lowland rice, and then uh, the upland rice. And then there's even other systems, the minor systems, were developed in the mangroves. There are systems that are in rivers themselves, or recession agriculture systems. So many different types of rice cropping systems in all these different uh, climate zones. You see, it's 
fairly complicated to talk about rice in West Africa. So despite all that, despite the history, despite the big distribution and, and cultivation in uh, West Africa, uh, Africa still is the largest importer of rice in the world. And West Africa itself spent $4 billion in 2017 to import rice. So the heads of states of the community, economic community of the West African states, the heads of states came together and said, you know, that doesn't make any sense. Here we have the land, we have the culture, this is a staple crop. Let's try to become rice self-sufficient um, because we're spending so much of our foreign exchange in importing it. Um, so, but that's a big challenge because when we look um, when we look at the um, consumption, so these, this uh, figure shows you the consumption of, of rice. The blue part is what's produced, and the yellowish part is what's imported. So when we go from 2010 to 2017, we see actually that rice production increased by 24%. That's a lot if you think of, that's a real big effort in rice production increase. But that increase was not enough because the consumption even increased more than that by 35%. So making uh, to an effect that actually the self-sufficiency rate went down instead of up. So the government still have that uh, goal, but you can see in 2025, it should be about 24 million tons of, of rice produced, whereas right now they are about at 10 million. So it's really a big challenge still to, to get to, to that goal. Now the, ch it, the challenge is big because you know, the, the, the gap is big and uh, the progress is slow in increasing rice. Not, not fast enough. Um, we can say that the proposed solutions today are still mostly input-based solutions, um, but they show their limits. They are expensive. Farmers can't afford them, or they don't have access to them. They are dependent on having access to uh, inputs in order to produce, improve their production. And on the other side, we also are associated with a lot of environmental problems like water overuse, uh, pesticide pollution of waterways, etc., etc. So re yields are still very low. Two tons per hectare is, is quite a low yield. Now, what could be uh, some other solutions? Um, area expansion, yes, because there's still a lot of land in West Africa available for rice production, huge potential of land, but that means a lot of investment needs to go into developing that land, so that's a challenge as well. And then we have the agronomic solutions, which have been largely neglected and overlooked so far. So I'm going to focus on those now. And uh, the good news is that we actually do have alternative production um, uh, and climate smart uh, rice production approaches, agroecological approach called the system of rice intensification um, that has been proven it's to work in many places for the past 20 years and is, is uh, ready to be scaled up. So um, I want to quickly introduce you to what that system is um, and it's, it's it's based on changing the practices of growing the rice. So when you change the practices of growing the rice with the goal for the plant to be able to express its genetic potential. So the question is, how would I go about planting my crop the best way so it actually expresses its potential? Um, conventionally, on the left side, when in the irrigated uh, rice production, um, conventionally um, farmers grow uh, nurseries and transplant older seedlings of 30 to 40 
five days, uh, several seedlings in one clump, and closely spaced. Then they irrigate the, the field for the entire growing season and use um, fertilizers and agrochemicals, herbicides, to, to manage uh, fer fertility, etc., and the pest and weed problems. That's the conventional way. Now with the SRI practices, it's quite a difference. Farmers transplant very young seedlings, uh, only one seedling in one clump, and they increase the spacing. So what does that do? The plant suddenly has space, and when plants are young, they can actually produce the tillers, and they can grow the roots. Um, in favor of that, too, is if the soils are improved with organic matter, so we really want to build up a, a soil health, um, roots can grow well, they can expand, and they can feed on, on the nutrients in the, uh, from, from the uh, created through the organic matter and from the healthy soil. Alternate wetting and drying means we would not irrigate consistently anymore, but let the soil dry out. That, again, allows roots to breathe and to grow even better, and they grow deeper. So what these quite simple changes in practices, what does it do? The plant changes quite remarkably. The rice plant is a very plastic plant. The rice crop reacts a lot to different ways of being, being planted. So with the SRI system, now you see that you get more tillers, thicker tillers per plant. Um, the roots are double and deeper, which I just explained. But then also, interestingly, the panicles where the rice grains sit, they get longer, and they get fuller, and they get heavier. And so farmers get better, better yields. So the, the, the um, benefits are quite striking. So we get better yields, 20%, 50%, sometimes up to 100% better yields. While at the same time, we do so water, because rice actually doesn't love the water. It thrives better, it grows better, when there's not, it's not growing in stagnant water. We can reduce the seedling, the seed amount, by 90%, because we do single seedling transplant. And, uh, and the agrochemicals, there is uh, in many countries now in India and, um, and, and Asia, people have removed, moved completely to 100% um, reduction in chemicals, means um, into organic rice production. And now reduced cost and um, higher yields means uh, the uh, net return is going up. So the global spread today is, is, fairly, is, is, is fairly big today, more than 55 countries. If you want to know more about the method, uh, some of you may know about it, some have heard for, for the first time. Um, here, um, the SRI Rice Center is here based in, uh, in, uh, uh, at IPCALS. Lucy Fisher is the communications director, and uh, there's a lot of, um, the, uh, a lot of information. And actually, the SRI uh, um, was sh shown to be, I mean, was taken from when it was developed in Madagascar to the rest of the world uh, by Professor Norman Uphoff, who is uh, today uh, unfortunately not here. But he's also a Cornellian. And he certainly is, would be happy to talk to you if you have questions. So that's my introduction. And I want to take you on a journey that started for me 12 years ago. Um, at that point, I, I lived and worked in, in Mali uh, as an independent consultant. And I was asked by the NGO Africare if I would help them to implement a rice, uh, a rice uh, a SRI plot. And I said, OK, well, I can go have a look. Um, so they, they sent me to Timbuktu. And I was like, wait a minute, Timbuktu, that's like at the edge of the Sahara Desert, the ancient city. It's like in the middle of the Sahara. Why do I grow rice in Timbuktu? But I was corrected very quickly because out of that little plane you see there, suddenly I had this view. 
So this is the inner Niger Delta of Mali, which is the second biggest wetland of Africa. This is actually where the African rice was domesticated. I was just talking about in the beginning. Um, Timbuktu is just north of, of this inner Niger Delta, and the Niger River grow, goes through that delta and goes all the way up to Timbuktu, it hits the desert, and then it goes back down through Niger and goes into the Niger Delta in, in Nigeria. So here you can see this is a village, and here we have rice fields. Here we have some rice fields. These look now nicely irrigated, arranged. There are some rice fields here, but they're not irrigated. So you see it looks like desert. <laughs> so um, when I arrived up there in Timbuktu, I met this gentleman, um, Mohamedou Hamadoun. And, from, and I was set out to implement the first SRI plot with him, as well as another fellow farmer. Uh, there were two volunteers who said, yes, let's try this new method. One farmer quickly dropped out, and it was only him who, who, who tried it out. And I did not really have that much hope. I didn't have much expectation for this, for this trial. I've never actually implemented SRI myself. So I was like, OK, let's try this. But you know, we don't really know what will happen. So, but, Africa on the other side, they were much more excited because they got some field, no, uh, field uh, uh, reports from, you know, this rice field does really well and the farmers are very interested. So I went up there again to check that out. Um, uh, Africa uh, organized a lot of farmer visits. Uh, uh, village leaders came together several times. There were in-depth discussion, what's changing in the method. And when the farmers were seeing that that plot produced actually nine tons uh, per hectare, which is sometimes double of what the re in the region people produce, they were really, really excited. And so the village elder and the elder council and the village leaders, they came together. And up there, it's very important. You know, they have the saying. They came together and said, we want to try this method next year. <laughs> um, so Africa, you better help us. We want to have a closer look on how this works. So that was then, uh, all right, that was very serious. So we had to kind of like think about, so how are we going to do that? Respond to those uh, uh, villages that th these gentlemen were pre representing. And um, so then the Africa office decided, let's do it in the 12 villages next year. So make it serious. Make this a very serious effort in 12 villages with five farmers per village and doing it in, a, uh, in an effort that uh, a, a voluntary effort. Uh, so Minister of Agriculture, NGO of, on Africa, and that's the distribution. Again, you see here, this is the Niger River. And it's starting to, during the rainy season, it starts to flood all these arms. Uh, it's very, very, very interesting. Very interesting environment. So then I was like thinking, well, so how are we going to do this? 60 farmers. I myself have never implemented SRI. People there had no idea. <laughs> I've never done it. So how are we going about it and be serious about it? So uh, what we did, we we downloaded the only manual in French in, the, in that time from Madagascar, from the Cornell website. We downloaded it. And Madagascar is very different conditions than the desert of Timbuktu. No? Um, and so the agriculture technicians who work with the farmers, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture technician, I mean, we just sat in a room I was, we started reading that manual, step by step, soil preparation, land leveling. Then I was like, all right, this is what they do in Madagascar. How is it done here in, in Timbuktu? And so we would compare the practices and think about why would they be the way they are and why, how would we have to change the practices in this environment? 
So by like half a day, sometimes a day, we would just sit in the office and talk through the best way of implementing those. And then we had some kind of a technical itinerary. We would go out, next stop was the farmer's field and discuss it with the farmer volunteers. So let's implement it together. And uh, we would stay in the field and we would just figure out how the first or second field, how to go about implementing those different practices. And so it has been a very rich process. By the end of the season, we had a technical manual. It's like, you know, very solid technical manual, how to implement SRI in Timbuktu. So, um, and the technicians, the agriculture technicians stayed very close to the farmers. They visit them every week. They say, no, please don't irrigate that much uh, water. You know, uh, they were uh, going along and, and uh, really helping um, implement the methods. And by doing so, they learned also. They observed, they exchanged, they, they thought about it. So the, again, the results were very good. They were very good, and they also got a lot of attention. So how we went about, this is the technical manual. I, I was just um, this, um, mentioning. We did a very detailed technical report so people could really read up. So it was really well substantiated. And then maybe the most interesting thing we did was we actually created a blog. In 2008, that wasn't something people would just do. Um, and every two weeks, we would update that with new photographs. Oh, look what's happening. Farmer so-and-so is weeding the field now. And oh, look, this, this plant has lots of tillers today. And so um, this blog was then, Africa shared it with the USA, the World Bank, offices in the capital. And uh, those who were responsible for the program were tuning in every two weeks. So what's happening up in Timbuktu? So they could see, it's almost like a webcam, they could just see what's happening in the field. And so suddenly these uh, farmers started to get uh, loads of other farmers visiting from all the different regions. All these delegations traveled to Timbuktu. They wanted to see it for themselves. We had World Bank visitors, even the director uh, of USA, the country director, spent a whole day with the farmers. And so there was a lot of um, visits. And the interesting part was, it was the farmers who were the first experts, no? It was them who explained to everybody else, oh, this is how we do it, and this is how it works. So it was very, very uh, interesting. It was just wonderful to to just observe uh, those and to be part of those field days. Um, so then, USAID said, yes, this is something, uh, we have a RISE program, let's do it next, the next year and let's um, expand this. Same, uh, same exercise, let's go to Gao. This is like, you see the river here. Let's go to Gao, let's go to Mopti, let's go to Segu. And Sikasso was a rain-fed area. This is actually where the women were growing rice. Up here is mostly men who grow rice. So interesting, um, then there was a foundation. Syngenta Foundation wanted to be part of it. The National Research Organization was a little skeptical in the beginning, but they were hired to monitor the fields. And so they were, they were creating the data of what's happening in the field. I'm presenting them. A Ministry of Agriculture, of course, involved everywhere. And then out of this, the first national SRI conference was launched in Bamako, uh, which uh, was um, very successful. Uh, farmers, researchers, ministry, uh, etc. Now, from that conference, Actually, there was a, 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 a project that was there that was a regional project. So let's, let's, let's take these good methods and share with other countries. So the uh, EATP project from USAID was a regional project. They started to fund programs in, uh, uh, um, in these yellow uh, six countries in the, with the yellow boxes. 
uh, including other initiatives from other places um, since 2000, like in Gambia, uh, Sierra Leone, we had um, independent initiatives. So the awareness started to rise. People were interested. They asked for more training. They asked for more assistance. At that point, it was the question, OK, why don't we, why don't we think about a regional approach, a regional project? That would be most appropriate because we saw the, the horizontal bands. If, Niger, if the farmers in Niger would like to learn about SRI, I think the farmers from Mali were most appropriate to teach them. You know, they, and so a regional approach would make a lot of sense for, for that exchange. Um, World Bank had a big uh, program at that time. Oxfam was interested. From Cornell, we contributed. And the Center of Excellence in Mali was uh, also part of it. And so this was the first uh, regional meeting um, farmers, researchers, and extension agents from each country came, debated about, do we want a regional project? And the conclusion of this meeting was, yes, we would like to go forward with a regional project. So it became a commissioned project, meaning it's asked by the countries. So the World Bank can then just say, all right, this project has been asked for by the countries, so now we just ask them to develop the project proposal. They didn't have to go through bidding and all these other um, uh, ways of, of developing project proposals. So now this project, we implemented it from 2014 to 2016. Um, through this big West African agriculture productivity program, which was in each country and funded through the World Bank. Um, the Center of Excellency in Rice, based in Mali and Cornell, we assumed the technical coordination of that regional project. As I just mentioned, from the regional level now, what were the tasks? The coordination, technical assistance, monitoring the evaluation so that everybody is on the same page, and the communication. So that these were somehow the regional pillars on how we supported the countries. At the national level, there were two asks, that the countries identify a national facilitator, which is not just a project facilitator, but a facilitator that could help facilitate all the SRI activities in the country, and that the project is built on champions. Because champions were, we define champions as being the leaders of SRI activities in the countries before the project came. And there were a number of them there. This could be farmers, could be technicians, could be researchers, or program managers. People really showed that they went, uh, uh, you know, um, they really pushed or really implemented some projects. So these people were taken or almost kind of recruited into the project. So yes, please, you have experience with this method. You know how it works. You're convinced about it. Can you come and you know, participate and help? Now, within the countries, the, the countries were fairly independent in their decisions. The national facilitator and, um, and the champions, they were able to um, decide where, where in the country they wanted to work what they wanted to work on, with whom they wanted to work. Would they go through NGOs? Would they go through uh, research uh, organizations? Would they go through farmer organizations? And the scale. Would they, would they just concentrate in one region, or would they want to take a whole country approach? So that was left to the country. So you could imagine each country had a different approach, it had a different rhythm, had a different scale, but that was basically what we want it, we don't really want to impose that. It should come from the countries themselves. And then we had thought about, so how are we going about? This is a huge project, 13 countries. People speak different languages. <laughs> um, there's all these different regions, different uh, uh, cultures. And 
first and foremost, it will be very important that we have, we all speak the same language, no? Or else we will never get anywhere. That we all agree on the same understanding. It will be very important. That we harmonize how we're going to collaborate, you know? Um, and as, with that is kind of like, how can we build a community of practice? So people think they're part of a larger group and we all work together on something. That they're excited and motivated to be part of this bigger endeavor. Then uh, working with farmers, implement SRI, monitor, analyze, communicate, exchange, learn. So that was very important. Um, and then once the more and more results are coming in, and more and more confidence, and more and more um, uh, back, uh, back up and more capacities built, then it could go to a larger, larger scale and can be promoted at a larger scale. But our project was only two and a half years long. So the, this part here is still coming up in our, in our uh, next phase of, of, um, of scaling up. But so that's a little bit the process. So very quickly, how did we go about understanding SRI in the same way? Because uh, when we prepared a project, each country, each person had a different opinion. And there were big debates. Oh, SRIs, you have to plant a seedling at 12 days age. If it's 15, then it's not SRI anymore. Other people say, no, no, you can still call it SRI. But you can't do it for direct seeding. Or you can't do it this way. And that's not SRI. And so we were like caught in these debates. What is it? What is it not? And people wouldn't think about how to go about implementing it. So. Um, that brought us to thinking about, so the question would not be, what about a 12-day-old 12, 12 seedling? The question is, why would we plant? Why would we do that? Why, what, what's the reason why we plant young seedlings? Because, as I just uh, explained, because we see it has the potential to grow more tillers, to grow more roots, um, you know, and, and to, to to at, at the end pro produce better. So when we look at those reasons why uh, the practices have been implemented, we can come to some kind of guiding principles. Guiding principles that guide the practice, that are very practical, they're not abstract. And so you came up with four, four different principles. Early and healthy plant establishment. Yes, so that's when I plant a young seedling I contribute to an early and healthy plant establishment. That, in combination with minimizing competition between plants, build a fertile soil, and manage the water carefully, you know, with that creates that synergy that gives us this SRI effect where the plants develop better. So if we have those principles, then the practices can change because the situations in the farmer's field change. Somebody says, I want to do direct seeding. Let me pre-germinate my seed. That will help, for instance, a faster establishment. So it responds to the principle. And, and so, so basically it allows people to adapt this method to their local conditions. So when I proposed this to the countries, they were like, oh yeah, that makes sense. That, that, that works for us, so let's adopt this and let's try that. So it was the first time this was tried as, as some kind of a framework and everybody could just get to work because they could align themselves within those four, four pillars. Now again, people went to work, they went into all the different areas and regions um, and tried to now identify what are those, those practices? Um, from that perspective, we were then organizing a regional training. We trained 60 trainers from all 13 countries within that principle-based approach. And they, in turn, then went into countries and continued training. Um, in total, at the end of the project, we have more than 30,000 farmers trained and more than 1,000 
technicians. So that really, and that was all country decisions. Again, you know, the countries decided to. Um, then was that work with the farmers and adapting, finding the best practices in those different locations across the whole region. Now, we, and, you know, and ask farmers to innovate. So, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, in Burkina Faso, they were doing compost making. In uh, Mali, they um, developed those mobile SRI nurseries. Um, there was a mechanization problem. We were able to imp uh, import some beaters from India or Guinea used SRI for seed production. So you had all these initiatives that came up from the different sides, from the countries, depending on how they were able to respond to this. And so the, the, the beauty of this approach, and we just got started. We haven't really gotten into very, very long. But I think in the, in the future, this is exactly where we'll be, we'll be focusing on is um, um, the different best practices developed in the different um, environments can then be, either be identified, for instance, for the irrigated system in the arid zones. These are the best practices of SRI. In the lowland systems of um, the humid zones, these are the best practices of SRI. And so we can get very, very uh, detailed and identify the best practices according to uh, different locations. And the beauty of a, of a regional project is also that we have these bands. So, you know, for instance, here, the nor northern Benin is much closer to northern Togo and northern Ghana than to uh, southern Ghana and southern Benin and Togo. So farmers from that band can relate much better to each other than to the farmers in other parts of their own country. So that's why, again, a regional approach is, is very, very um, interesting and can create a lot of uh, interesting practices and, um, and innovations. So just to show you an example, at the end of the project, what happened in Senegal? Senegal, in the project, the country decided to uh, focus on the lowland areas in this, in this area. But the facilitators and the project, they trained other people in other areas, which then also got the technical materials, the monitoring, and they could add to the results at the end of the project. And then this is the irrigated zone of Senegal, a very different system, but again, people were able to contribute their results because they also had national meetings, and so they started to exchange at the national level among, among each other. So it's not just what happened in the project, but how that was used to uh, include others in the project. And then when we aggregated everything, and that's also the strength of a regional project, when you aggregate all the country maps, you come to a fairly impressive map with more than 1,000 sites, 50,000 farmers. Um, yields were high. Again, very substantial yield in increases. And, um, and so the, there was this, this uh, um, spread and the dissemination, which worked really, really well. Um, harmonized implementation approach. So here, it was very important to, to not to create new institutions and new practices, but to work through what, what, was, avail what was, in the, was in the country. To create open platforms. So if, if, as I just mentioned with the Senegal model, when people were interested in, in participating in the project, they were able to get that knowledge too. So uh, create and allow interested parties to participate. And then very important, a face-to-face -face interaction, regional meetings. Let all the countries come together, share their, what they were uh, achieving the past year, and then plan together as well. Because with that, then they get motivated through each other. Um, they got new insights, and they, they want to be better than the country, uh, neighbor country. So that gets a little healthy competition, and they inspire each other. 
And we were able to see within three years, there was a very big change in attitudes and in ownership and in pride and in driving the uh, activities and initiatives. Um, also, so you see like the number of institutions that were active before the project and after the project quadrupled in all, in all countries, significantly higher participation. So scaling up, uh, we reached 50,000 farmers, but if we look at West Africa, that's basically 1.1% 1, 1 .1 of farmers. So we have a widespread, but we haven't really changed rice production yet. So we, we think if we were to want to change it, at least make the methods and the knowledge available, we could improve rice production quite a bit. And so if we assume a tipping point, if we reach, let's say, 33% of all farmers, at least who know about, have been exposed to the methods, to the, uh, to, so that could create a tipping point for the, per, for the method to be mainstream, to be integrated into a general way of, of rice farming. Um, next phase, uh, we had a, had a small interruption of our project phases, and that was maybe one of, um, but we're continuing now with, uh, with a new project under development through the Adaptation Fund. It's in progress of, a process of development. And um, I think we just want to continue with the same implementation approach institutionally, focus really on farmer-centered, the farmer-centered approach, uh, and expand on a systems approach. So we would integrate other, other important aspects of water management, soil management, pest and disease management, et cetera, which are issues that are coming up in the face of, of climate change. And then as more results are coming in, as we're more robust in the field, the poli policy dialogue can be increased and um, can, can lead to better po policy recommendations. So this, I'm almost finished. I have three more slides where I just want to give you a few reflections on well, what made this to me I mean, I've, I've mentioned it already, what made this successful? And how does it uh, maybe contrast to other approaches? One other approach is the, the more classic extension and research approach. And um, where actually is more a, a linear approach. Where, and it is um, kind of, uh, to me, sometimes very amazing that this, this approach still um, <laughs> is happening in many places and sometimes it's still dominant in certain circumstances. So I think it's important to think about um, what type of approach and how are we going about in research and in development when we intervene um, and when we collaborate with, with countries and farmers. So in the classic way, a research identified the constraints and certainly as students or researchers myself, you know, this is how we go about it sometimes, no? Identify, we do literature review or we get some feedback from somebody. Identify the constraints and then we go about do our research. We do on station research or do our studies, etc. Develop technologies. Those farmers need a new product. You know, what's the latest new product that can help save, the, you know, make the farmer's livelihoods better? So that's always uh, a lot if it's just thought about somewhere far away from reality of the farmers. Um, and then what's the output from what people do? It's research papers or even maybe technical guidelines. And then they pass on the technology to the extension. So the package of technology comes and now the extension uh, service has to train farmers, has to make that technical package available and help farmers to adopt it, you know, implement it. So the farmer becomes the recipient. You're not participating. But sometimes participate in giving some feedback, but it's, yeah, this works for me. Oh, no, this doesn't work for me. But then there's a reason, oh, this doesn't work. So let's do something else. So it's kind of detached. It's linear. We call it 
transfer of technology, and I still hear this word today in many places. Um, but at the end of the day, we say, hey, so what, 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 what's happened to a farmer? Does it work? We come back five years later. Does it work for them? Or maybe we move down to something else, another interesting project, and we forget about the farmer. Uh, so in contrast, I think with, with, our, with our project, we kind of have a, a farmer-centered approach. Researchers, extension staff, and farmers all participate in the process. So if we, if we start on top, we agreed, okay, we agreed at the beginning that SRI is something that we would like to train people uh, with, uh, uh, um, farmers should be able to benefit from that methodology. So what we did is we, we didn't prescribe how to implement SRI, but we trained farmers in the principles. So far, the farmers have a knowledge now, and they will go and decide on the practices. This is the practice that can work for me, or this is the practice that doesn't work for me, and I need to adjust it. So then um, the next step is the researcher need to collect the data. What works for the farmers? What are they doing? What works? Uh, field visits, exchanges, learnings, new people come, so that this will be all discussed. Um, then the data analysis, data aggregation, etc., which then can come with uh, uh, identify, oh yes, these are maybe our best locally adapted SRI practices that come from the field that we have identified so far and that work. So, the same um, data analysis is in communication. Communication, the results will be communicated back to the farmer. Uh, to the researchers, or to the policymakers, to the program managers, to the donors, etc. And that then reinforces the solutions that work for the farmers because we actually identify them all through what comes from them. You know? So, uh, and we also identify constraints where, where farmers struggle, where it doesn't work. Uh, and then from there, New knowledge is always welcome, increased partnerships, and then it goes and maybe in another cycle. And I think the more cycles we have, the more dense the knowledge gets, the more integrated the different uh, 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 agroecological uh, principles, systems. We have systems-based thinking. We can branch out into other, into other areas and, and domains. So. And that's my last slide. I think for our project, the agroecological approach worked really well because it allows to, to be based on knowledge. There's nothing to sell. Farmers gain the knowledge, and they can work with it. They don't need to buy something. You know? uh, and that empowers. That empowers farmers because with knowledge, them, just the knowledge they have, they can change. Their, their practices and their systems, and then they get innovative. So I think it's very, very important to see how you'll be able to empower people to develop their own solutions. Ownership of the process at the farmer's level, but again, as I mentioned before, the national levels, there was a lot of determination what the different countries were, were doing and how they implemented it and how they went about it. Um, Building a community of practice, very important. So you have a team building. You feel like we're all in the same team and, and we complement each other. Everybody has a different role to play. And, and so we're all kind of pulling the cart together and, and complement, help each other out. Increase partnerships. I think as you scale up, it's very important to have a broad uh, level of, of partnerships. And then keep the focus very clear in the field. Adapt, innovate, learn, exchange, analyze, communicate, and just go and plug away on actually the real practices and, and techniques in the field so that they work for, for the farmers. Um, yeah, and so thank you. Um, we've written a big report. You can download it. 
And there's a lot of, uh, for each country, a big uh, country chapter. Um, the approach is explained. The regional analysis is in there. The country analysis are in there. And um, so I thank you for your attention. Um, and if you want to follow up on anything, and if you're interested, you know, my, my contact is here. I'm at Cornell, so please welcome. Yeah, right. It always takes more time. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Any questions? The benefits of women? Yes. Yeah, so you know, there's there's you know, in different countries you have different. Yeah, as I mentioned, in northern Mali, it's only the men who grow rice. But actually, there we also were able to, uh, you know, uh, emphasize or motivate uh, women to participate, and that was a very big success. I think in southern Mali, for instance, where women, or in Gambia, where women, where rice is a food crop, and usually is not paid that much attention to by the men or the household. You know, where, where men focus more on the cash crops. So the women who grow down their food crop, they're always struggling, you know. They're always there. They don't have any tools. They have all this other work. Um, uh, there, there is a lot of, of work to grow rice. It's a very complicated crop. It's a lot of work. So if the productivity can increase, they may be able to reduce the plot size. Or if they have a simple tool that is not in competition with men's, agriculture interests, you know, then they can actually make, uh, they can move ahead much better with, with, with their own production and that can then give them some income. I mean, I've seen people have uh, create income. Women who were able to say, now I can send my kids to school. I mean, that's a big thing, you know. Or I can have a small saving and I'm starting to do my own oil cake business or Something, something else. So there's some kind of um, um, that kind of benefit. Any kind of health benefits from not having to work in flooded fields? Oh, I see the the flooded fields. Yeah, I mean, I I know I know of it. And uh, yes, I mean uh, there there's often when women weed or they uproot the nurseries, they sit in the fields for days and days and days, and it's not very good for the for the health. And uh, so, yeah, with the SRI practice, they, they get to work on dry bed nurseries, small seedlings. Um, the weeding is done with a, with a weeder, where you actually stand upright, and you don't have to bend and be in the water, which is, you know, very uh, bad for your feet for your, for in, the long, in the long run. So, yeah, so there, these are some health benefits that are associated with it. Is there any corporate role in this project? Corporate role. Yeah. Um, where this, what's the origin of the seeds? Are they traditional seeds? All right. So this method is basically seed neutral. You can call it seed neutral. You can use traditional seeds. You can use um, uh, even the African rice grows better with it. Uh, or uh, you can use uh, hybrid seeds or high yielding seeds, you know. But it's a neutral technique uh, method because it just goes on to the productivity of the plant. And it allows to, to yeah, so it's not seed dependent. Yes, you had a question. So I was looking at the, um, the map of SRI presence in the FOS states. And in some of those states, they're, the big importers are not thinking about backwards implementation. So has there been a lot of private sector buy-in into SRI methods, or are they just unaware? Yeah, so it's, it's an interesting Yeah, so there's, the, the, there's always the, the, I think the private sector is becoming more aware. I mean, uh, the benefit of getting better grain is there. You know, when they go to the mill, the grain is, is improved. And, and Actually, farmers could get a better price for better, for, for, for better grain. But I think that awareness is, is starting to, to come um, um, into place. And private sector starts to, to um, 
especially in the value chain, you know, know the mills. And, and um, some farmer organizations have tried to develop their own brands of rice that they can sell in the supermarkets or on the market. So, so I mean, uh, it's starting. You know, it's, a, it's just this very bottom-up process. And um, I think it, we, we are at the stage where it gets noticed and where more and more private sector companies are coming, coming in. You said there were 60 trainers that were identified in the countries, and I was wondering how those trainers were identified. Yeah, so again, I, there was, it was based a lot on the champion role. And then uh, if the countries had already, it were, for instance, Senegal, they were saying, we want to work in this specific zone because they were working, for instance, in this lowland zone that didn't get much attention by other donors. And then they were looking for farmer leaders in that zone who were very uh, upward and forward and were very dynamic. So these were chosen and they were sent to the regional training. And then when they went back, they were fulfilling their roles within the communities of trainers. Uh, what is the impact of SRI implementation to pest and disease development? Pest and disease uh, development. Yeah, so uh, as you've seen, the, the plants get stronger. They're, they're, they're healthier and stronger. And sometimes even, I mean, there the, are the studies that show that the, I mean, the stems are bigger. They're harder. Yeah, and so uh, then they're healthier. They have more space. Um, so there's a lot of uh, impact. A healthier plant, you know, can be more resistant against pest and disease uh, pressure, uh, can better resist. And I've seen things, uh, in the field sometimes I've seen farmers who have for the first time applied some manure on the land. So oh, I've never done it before. And those plants look so much better. Just that comparison, there was just this disease going over those weak plants. <laughs> whereas the others were not touched. So, and there was the same variety. Um, that's one thing. Then you have wider spacing and more aeration, less humidity and uh, less, less water. So there's less humidity in the whole uh, uh, system. So the diseases don't spread as quickly because they need humidity to spread. Um, yeah, and then st stronger plants. Um, yeah, there's many different... Um, examples of, of pest and disease, uh, better resistance. Um.